Hello guys, how are you? I'm Hadeep Singh. Welcome back to your own YouTube channel. IELTS updates and recent exams. For more updates related to recent IELTS exam writing test topics, listening, reading, practice test, and speaking, you can just work. Please guys, participate in everyday listening and reading practice test to achieve your desired band score in your actual IELTS exam. Please hit the like and subscribe button. Press the bell icon for the upcoming notifications. Don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page IELTS updates and recent exams. Part 1 You will hear a telephone conversation between a travel agent and a school principal who is organizing a school tour for a group of third-year students. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 3. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 3. Hello, McFadden's Travel. James speaking. How may I help you? Hi there. My name's Jonathan Presley, Principal of Sainsbury Secondary School. I am calling to ask about your early bird tour offer. I saw it advertised in the Evening Herald yesterday. Certainly, Mr Presley. What would you like to know? Oh, please. Jonathan will be fine. Of course, Jonathan. How can I help you? Well, the first thing I'd like to know is how long is your offer valid for? My third-year students are planning a holiday in early April. Will they qualify for the discount? The good news is our special offer runs until the end of May. Oh dear, oh dear, March. That's terrible. We've just missed out. On the contrary, Jonathan. It's May, not March. You will qualify for the discount. Oh, fantastic! And I'm only just getting started. The best news is yet to come. What do you mean? Well, tell me now, how many students are you planning to take on this tour? I expect there'll be about 45 students and three teachers accompanying them. Why? Are there any further discounts? There are indeed. We do a 25% discount on groups of up to 40 people. For you, we can offer an even better rate. A 50% discount. Wow! Is that on top of the 15% early bird discount? It most certainly is, which makes your total tour discount, um, 50 plus 15, 65%. Surely there's a catch. This is too good to be true. Well, there is a condition that you must choose your destination from a list we have selected. You can't book a tour to just anywhere in the world with this discount rate. I see. And would Madrid be on that list by any chance? Uh, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but we do not offer this rate on tours to Madrid. However, we have an excellent all-inclusive seven-day Barcelona tour which is available. How does that sound? Sounds interesting. What is the total cost per student? Let's see... It works out at £679 per person with the discount. The normal price is £1,940, so you are saving £1,261 per person. Hold on a moment. Let me get a pen to write some of this down. It's getting complicated. OK, how much will it cost per student? £679. And how much of a saving is that? £1,261. Barcelona sounds very good indeed. Uh, tell me, what do you mean by all-inclusive? What does £679 get us? Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 4 to 10.
Now listen and answer questions 4 to 10. Well, that price covers flights, three-star hotel accommodation and extras. James, I must say I'm very glad I called you this morning. This is a fantastic deal. It covers flights, accommodation and what else? Plus airport taxis, breakfast every morning, a city tour and theatre tickets. Great. And what about the teachers? The teachers can travel free of charge with the students. Well, I might just go on this tour myself. I've always fancied a trip to Barcelona. <laughs> but uh, for the children's sake, of course. <laughs> of course. Now, let's get to work on the booking. Exactly when were you planning to leave? The 7th of April, if possible. Yes, that's available. And can you confirm the exact number of students, please? It's either 44 or 45. Uh, let me see. Yes, 45. Exactly 45 students. No, sorry, uh, in fact that's 46. I forgot about Jenny McCarthy. She sent her application in late, so it's not in the same pile as the rest. So that's the 7th of April and 46 students, correct? Yes, perfect. And three teachers. Is there a morning flight? Yes. Your flight is at 7am on Monday the 7th of April. Arrive at the airport two hours before departure. The flight will take about two and a half hours and you'll land at 10.30am local time. How does that sound? Sounds great. Can I give you my email address to confirm the rest of the details? Of course. It's jonathan.presley at sainsbury.com. That's j-o-n-a-t-h-o-n dot p-r-e-s-l-e-y at s-a-i-n-s-b-u-r-y dot com and we'll pay by credit card if possible. That'll be perfect. What's your card number? It's 6676-6654-9767. One two five one. Expiry date: O one Jan two thousand and fifteen. And the name on the credit card? That's my own, Jonathan Presley. So six hundred and seventy-nine pounds times forty-six students. Um, I'm going to charge thirty-one thousand two hundred and thirty-four pounds to your credit card. That's the total cost. Sounds fine. Great. Well, I think that's all we need for now, Jonathan. It's been a pleasure doing business with you. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to give me a call. We'll be in touch next week to confirm the booking details. OK, and thank you very much for your help, James. Bye for now. Bye-bye, Jonathan. Speak soon. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. You will hear an extract from a talk about the history of motor racing. First, you will have time to look at questions 11 and 12. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 and 12. Good morning and welcome to the programme. This week we're continuing our series of features on motor racing and I am delighted to welcome to the show David McWilliams, widely recognised as the most knowledgeable motor racing historian in England. 
we've invited David in to talk to us about what is probably the most famous and prestigious motor racing championship in existence today. That is, of course, Formula One. David, Formula One is now a massive racing franchise, but how did it all begin? Well, uh, Formula One has its roots in the European Grand Prix Motor Racing Championship, which began in the 1920s. After World War II, the Grand Prix was transformed into a new championship format, the one we are familiar with today, Formula One. The formula stands for the rules which all the drivers and manufacturers must respect. The One signifies that this racing championship is regarded as the best in the world. The first World Championship race was held in 1950 at Silverstone in England. It was won by Italian Giuseppe Farina in his Alfa Romeo. Farina narrowly beat his teammate Juan Manuel Fangio of Argentina to the title, yet it was Fangio who would go on to dominate the sport for the rest of the decade, winning five World Championships. As the years went by, the sport became a global phenomenon and grew from strength to strength, becoming the biggest commercial sport on the planet. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 13 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 13 to 20. There's no doubt that Formula One is big business today, David. But what about the real heroes, the great drivers of Formula One, past and present? Who stands out as the best, in your opinion? That's an almost impossible question to answer, but I could narrow it down to three or four amazing drivers. Take your pick from any one of them. I'll start with the Grandmaster of Formula One, the great Fangio, who I've already mentioned. He dominated the sport throughout the 1950s, winning five titles in all, his first in 1951, his last in 57, a record that stood for 46 years. Indeed, he was the first multiple championship winner. Fangio was a fiery and spirited Argentinian who never gave up. His greatest moment came in winning the 1957 championship when he came back from a disastrous pit stop to recover a 30-second deficit and take the championship on the last lap of the last race of the season. That was, of course, to be the last time he'd win the title. Another undoubted great is Brazilian Ayrton Senna. Senna won the world title three times, the first being in 1988, the last in 1991. Tragically, he died in a race crash the year after, to the dismay of millions of fans watching the race unfold live on TV. Senna was best known for his skills driving in the wet, and he won the Monaco Grand Prix on what is regarded as the most difficult race course in Formula One more times than any other driver. Perhaps because of this, he is regarded as the most naturally gifted driver to have ever sat behind the wheel. Another very talented driver was Frenchman Alain Prost. Prost won the driver's title four times during his career. His first title victory came in 1985 and his last arrived in 1993. Of course, Prost will always be remembered as the driver with the third highest number of championship victories and perhaps even more for the fact that he was a great rival of Ayrton Senna. Those two had many great battles. Last but not by any means least, Michael Schumacher is the most recent of these driving greats who deserves a mention. His first title was won in 1994, and he continued to dominate Formula One until he won his last title in 2004. Schumacher holds many driving records, including most drivers' championships, race victories, fastest laps, pole positions, points scored and most races won in a single season. He is also regarded as the greatest driver on paper, having won seven world titles. 
It sounds like Schumacher is in a league of his own. Is he not clearly the best then, David, based on his record? It's not that simple, unfortunately. These drivers all raced in different eras, with different cars and under different circumstances. I don't believe we can say one was the out-and-out -out best, but rather that each was the best of his time. That's praise enough. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. In this section, you will hear a discussion between two students who have to describe a lawn sprinkler for part of their general science course. A lawn sprinkler is a machine designed to water gardens and lawns. In the first part of the discussion, the students are talking about the different parts of the sprinkler. Now listen to the conversation and label the parts of the sprinkler on the diagram. Hello, Scott. I believe you're going to be my partner for this practical session. Have you got the model set up? Yes, uh, it's right here. The instructions say we have to describe it first and label the diagram. I've started from where the water enters the machine. Uh, the water enters through a hose pipe and then it turns a water wheel. You can see where the wheel is marked by an arrow pointing upwards. It's called a water wheel because it's designed so the water will catch against the wheel. This action spins a series of gears. How are you going to describe the gears? There are two worm gears, one vertical and one horizontal. The horizontal worm gear drives a circular gear. That gear is connected to a crank which changes the motion. The crank is already labelled. Do you see the two white arrows? I see. OK. The water has passed across the water wheel. Then what? OK. Um, then you could say the water passes through the spray tube. Yes, I see. And the water is then spread over the lawn through holes at the top of the spray tube. How are you going to describe the base? How about this? The sprinkler stands on a base consisting of two metal tubes which join at a hinge at one end and continue into a plastic moulding at the other. That's certainly starting at the bottom. Do you want to mention that there's no water in the base? I don't think that's necessary. If you look at the diagram, it's easy to see that the only metal tube to contain water is the spray tube. You can actually see the water coming out of it. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions. Hello, Scott, Linda. I'm glad I caught you before class. Did you know about the change in examination schedule? Change? Yes. The last day of examinations for your group will be December 2nd instead of November 29th. Is that definite? We were told they'd be on November 26th, and then there was a rumour they'd be on December the 1st. The schedule's gone to the printer. There can be no changes. It's definitely December 2nd. Oh, that's a relief. 
I'm going to the US on December the 4th. Are you one of the exchange students? Yeah, yeah. I'm really looking forward to studying there. Do you know if their general science courses are anything like ours? It's not very likely. Actually, all basic general science courses are fairly similar. You'll find you're behind in some things and ahead in others. I wouldn't worry too much about the course. You've been doing well on this one. Linda, have you finished your assignment yet? I'm nearly there. I should be able to give it to you on Monday. That's good. I can't let you have another extension. I was really grateful for the extra time you gave me. That was a really big assignment. Well, I'll expect it next week. Now, would you like to hear the details of the timetable? Oh, yes, please. I've just finished putting it on the notice board downstairs. Basically, you'll have four examinations. General Mechanics is in the morning of December 1st. Physics and Maths are on the afternoon of the same day. Communications and English are on the morning of December 2nd. And Earth Sciences in the afternoon. All over in two days. Yes. I'll miss teaching this class. You're all good at expressing your views, which makes for an interesting class. Some of the other first-year classes won't talk, and they're rather boring to teach. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. In this section, you'll hear a conversation between a tutor and a student about the strategies of note-taking. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Hi, Mr. Smith. I wonder whether you can spare several minutes with me. Sure. What's your name, please? John Murray. Good, John. Uh, what can I do for you? Well, I am a freshman in the communication faculty. I quite enjoy the life here, except for the difficulty I have in the lectures. You know, I find it difficult to take notes when I listen. If I take notes on my notebook, I can't concentrate on the lecture. But I feel frustrated after the lecture if I don't write down anything. As we know, note-taking is a complex activity which requires a high level of ability in many separate skills. At least four important skills are needed. Four? I don't expect so many! I think that needs one or two skills. Firstly, you have to understand what the lecturer says as he says it. That means you should try to develop the ability to infer the meaning of unfamiliar words from the context. You cannot stop the lecture in order to look up a new word or check an unfamiliar sentence pattern. Yes, that puts the non-native speaker like me under a particular severe strain. Often I may not be able to recognize words in speech, which I understand straight away in print. So the ability of inferring is important. Of course, you won't always be able to do this successfully. You must not allow failure of this kind to discourage you, however. It's often possible to understand much of a lecture by concentrating solely on those points which are most important. But how do I decide what's important? Well, that's in itself another skill I'd like to tell you. At first, the most important piece of information in a lecture is the title itself. If this is printed or referred to beforehand, you should study it carefully and make sure you're in no doubt about its meaning. 
A title often implies many of the major points that will later be covered in the lecture itself. It should help you therefore to decide what the main point of the lecture will be. Besides the title, what should I pay attention to during the speech? A good lecturer often signals what's important or unimportant. He may give direct or indirect signals. Many lecturers, for example, explicitly tell their audience that a point is important and that the student should write it down. Unfortunately, some lecturers who are trying to establish a friendly relationship with the audience are likely on these occasions to employ a colloquial style. He might say such thing as, This is, of course, the crunch, or perhaps you'd like to get it down. Although this will help the student who's a native English speaker, it may very well cause difficulty for the non-native speaker. You'll therefore have to make a big effort to get used to the various styles of his lectures. I see. You mean I should get used to some colloquial expressions of the lecturer and write down the points he recommends us to take? That's right. And it's worth remembering that most lecturers also give indirect signals to indicate what's important. They either pause or speak slowly or speak loudly or use a greater range of intonation or they employ a combination of these devices when they say something important. So I should be aware of this and focus my attention accordingly. If I can catch the main points, how can I write them quickly and clearly? Good question. That's a problem that most students find hard to solve. Having sorted out the main points, you have to write them down. In order to write at speed, you may find it helps to abbreviate. You can also try to select only those words which give maximum information. There are usually nouns, but sometimes verbs or adjectives. Writing only one point on each line also helps you to understand your notes when you come to read them later. I see! The last but not least skill to learn is to show the connections between the various points you've noted. This can often be done more effectively by a visual presentation than by a lengthy statement in words. Thus, the use of spacing, of underlining, and of conventional symbols plays an important part in efficient note-taking. In this way, you can see at a glance the framework of the lecture. Thank you so much, Mr. Smith. I think I'll employ the methods in the next lecture. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. So guys, don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page. I'll update some recent exams for more updates related to recent IELTS exam writing as topics, listening, reading, practice test and speaking you got guesswork. Please guys participate in everyday new IELTS listening and reading practice tests to achieve your desired band score in your actual IELTS exam. For more IELTS material, visit my official website www.IELTSUpdatesAndRecentExams.com. The link is given below in the description. If you need PDF files of latest IELTS material, then please join my Telegram channel. So guys, please write your score below the comment section. Again, thanks for listening. God bless you all guys. Stay tuned. Stay safe.